in the Revelation a little bit, Revelation, uh, the last book of the Bible. Uh, and some people are infatuated about it so much they draw away from the rest of the Bible, spend most of their time there. It's because it's interesting. It's um, intriguing. What's coming? How is he going to return? Uh, but I took in college a class on Revelation. And you know, I just had my presuppositions, my assumptions going in from things I'd grown up hearing and seeing and I hadn't spent a lot of time in it. I was you know, 20 at the time, and I remember stepping in. We were handed this book called The Four Views of Revelation. It's like, really? There's four? No, there's like hundreds, okay, of interpretations of, of prophecy. And it is uh, one thing Dr. Cook said at the very beginning, first day of class, he said, a lot of times we take revelation, we take prophecy, and we treat it... Um, he said, if you have a painting, he used a painting illustration. He said, we have a painting of, say, some men riding horses and, uh, in a beautiful field. And he said, and we get up close to the painting and we look at the toenail of, you know, the, the, the horse. He said, and we're missing all this. He said, when we get up close to a painting, he said, you don't do that with a painting. You step back and see the whole painting and you take in the beauty of it. You get too close, uh, you're missing it. And, that, and he reminded us that prophecy is for preparation. So there's absolute truths. And he would have made it literally abundantly clear if he wanted us to know everything. Now remember, go back a couple weeks ago, we talked about the dimensions and the fact if we were a two, remember the 2D, a lot of you like that illustration. If we were 3D creatures trying to tell 2D people, like stick people, what 3D things look like, right? It's hard. You can't do it. Can't even get the words to it. And so remember, when God's telling us things, he's, he's meeting us where we are and what we can understand, giving us what we need to know. So I'm going to prod you a little bit, and that's okay. I'm going to uh, stir some things up maybe in your mind, some questions maybe you've never asked before. Some of us have grown up in, in, with prophecy, and we've seen a movie, and we think, that's it. They got it figured out, the director of that movie. And they paint it one way. And m some of the most brilliant minds in Christendom, scholars disagree on... Things like tribulation, uh, things like millennial reign, if some of you have doused into this. Uh, some of you might go, I have no idea what those words mean. That's okay too, all right? We're going to pull some truths from this text, text for what Jesus wants us to know. Uh, there's, there's different camps that, that believe we're in tribulation. We've been in tribulation. Some believe that this tribulation period in, in Mark 13 references great tribulation. We'll talk about that a little next week. And Matthew 24 is a parallel passage of that as well. Uh, talk about great tribulation. Some believe that's after Jesus' return. So there's all these different camps. And some of us, some of you maybe right now are hearing that for the first time going, there's another view? Yes. And there's reason and scriptural basis for that. But these are non-essentials. They are not crucial to the faith. Uh, because, again, it's prophecy. It's not meant to be figured out. Prophecy is clear in hindsight. Uh, but the truth is still there. Be prepared. Be ready. So we'll talk about some of those things, and, and if I have a lot of stirring, I'll uh, present some of those views and comparative views on maybe on a Wednesday night Bible study or something like that. But I want us to pull the truth that we can apply. Uh, obviously, Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's talking to people there at the time. So this wasn't for far off. This is for them at the time, what they're about to experience. And he, again, is leaning in, and he'll talk, he'll end this chapter talking about when he comes again. Now, remember, in those days, they thought they had it figured out. If they thought within their time, they will see him come again. They didn't have it figured out, okay? So I'm going to make you think about some things. And don't get cemented into a view on the end times because you saw a movie or because you read a book. There were a series of books going around in the 90s, and they thought, man, this is Bible, man, right there with Bible, and, and, and again, Dig, study. I'm not going to give you every answer. I don't want you to just think just like me. Prod. Uh, if, uh, stir it up a little bit and go, go. It's good to wrestle through some of those things, all right? And uh, see what the Bible says. So let me make you think a little this morning. The Bible never ha has never hid the fact that we're going to be in tribulation. Uh, great, small, it's there. Uh, I, following Jesus is not popular. Uh, we, we, we talked about that over and over. Uh, Jesus doesn't sugarcoat the fact that suffering is real. I mean, suffering is a part of life because we are in a fallen world. We have a body that's affected by sin. 
Uh, the fact that we are praying for physical issues this morning and people in hospitals and, and even death is because of sin. So we have suffering, and the good news is that God walks with us through it. He doesn't leave us alone. Now, some, uh, as we read through this, uh, some will interpret some of these things more figurative, some more literal, and again, leaning more into, uh, he's pretty straightforward in the section we're in, uh, but as we look at uh, apocalyptic writing and how things will play out, there is tribulation. It's going on now, and it will continue to go on. It's been going on since the time this was written. The good news is these interpretive challenges don't change the heart of the text. Don't miss that. The most interesting viewpoint I have heard of recent, and uh, in reading a lot about uh, the second coming, was from an orthodox uh, theologian, and uh, this is, I don't agree with a lot of what they say, but this particular phrase I want to read to you, and a lot of what this guy says I don't agree with, but this was interesting. Bradley Jerzak said this, he said, let us read this book just as it was intended, not as end times code, but a retelling of the gospel in cosmic imagery, imagery, where the lamb on the cross in John's gospel is the same lamb on the throne seen from heaven's perspective. So he believes that uh, th that the book of Revelation is life and the gospel from the lens of heaven, with, with heaven's eyes looking down. Oh, it's fascinating. He had a lot to draw on there. The Bible has some things, again, that are absolutely clear. We need to know, love your neighbor as yourself. But when it comes to prophecy, and there's a reason it's written like it is. So draw on the fact that we need to be prepared. And uh, keep some of those disagreements open-handed. Uh, so let's move into Mark 13. As Jesus prepares his disciples to face some hard days ahead. The, you know what? We, we find the Bible's grimy, y'all. That's very Southern. You get, <laughs> the, Bible, the Bible's messy. Uh, but isn't life that way? It stretches us. It pushes us. It prods us. And I find that the things I have to wrestle through the most with God are those things that stick, that change me, that grow me. Maybe the things I'm not even comfortable with. Uh, some of the biggest churches in America are, are that way. I hesitate to even call them churches because they're just getting what they want to hear. They're, it's their own projection of themselves that they call Jesus. It's not the same Jesus we're seeing in the Bible. So oftentimes... Uh, we can't answer everything. We can't answer the whys and the hows. Uh, but Jesus gives, gives us what we need. He gives us what we need to know. And Jesus had a lot to say about the end of the world. But his focus may not be what you expect, church. He was more concerned with the how, of how we live in the present giving us a hope. And that's what affects how we live now. Uh, more than giving us a timeline of how events would play out. I know some of us would love that. Uh, so he doesn't give us a timeline of how the world's going to end, but he wanted his followers to focus on being faithful and not speculating about the end of the world. I, I've seen people that essentially throw in the towel because they just think they're done. It's like, remember, God can wake the dead. Uh, we think this is it, and, and they just become essentially neutral. God does not want us to live like that. I mean, that's why this passage is here. He's telling them, look, tough days are ahead. Persevere. Press on. Be prepared. Stay alert. So think about these things. Let's look in Mark 13. I'm going to do this a little differently than I normally do. I'm going to walk through section by section and explain this twofold. I'm going to explain some viewpoints here, uh, some uh, possibilities of, of interpretations of what people, uh, scholars have said this is. And um, the application to us now, which is the most important thing. Because there is some debate on what he was referencing in some of these passages. So, first off, the abomination of desolation. That's a phrase you use every day, right? 
What that basically means is a violation of holiness. A a figurative slap in the face of God. Now, when you think of it that way, we see that every day, don't we? We see our world doing that. In fact, if we weren't walking with Jesus, we'd do it too. And we'll talk about that in a moment. It says in verse 14, when you see the abomination of desolation... Now, I don't want to advise you to run up to anyone and say, that's an abomination of desolation. I don't know if they know what that means. But standing where it should not be. So Jesus here is referencing, this. they were familiar, the hearers at the time of what he's talking about. If This is mentioned in Daniel 7, where a king made a pagan offering, a pagan sacrifice in the temple of God. And so the principle we draw from here is what, first off, answer the question, what is a temple? It's where God's presence abides. So where is the temple now, church? What, is, what does the scripture say? Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Has that been desolated? Has that been uh, tainted? Absolutely. When we live apart from God, and as we talked in when he comes again, and we'll, we'll see next week, that will be the temple where God abides. Jesus was the temple here on earth, the presence of God in the flesh. He left us for the Holy Spirit to rule the temple. It, it, God dwells in us when we walk with Jesus. And one day we will be in the middle of his presence in heaven, his presence. So, I'm reminded of the scriptures as we think about our temple and the body being a temple and, and, and where we see this play out, how we see this play out. There were times where we see in uh, AD 70, we talked about this two weeks ago, that the temple was destroyed. So we see that happening there in real time. They experienced that. But we also see in our lives as our body is the temple. And the scripture says, if you're not for me, you're against me. If we're not walking with God, we have in our heart, if we shake our fist at God, if we walk away from Christ, if we follow ourselves, we are abomination and desolation. We are slapping God's, shaking our fist at God, essentially slapping God in the face, a violation of holiness. Jesus said our hearts Remember, we talked about this one too. Keep referencing, we talked about this one. But we did. <laughs> We're at enmity with God. Enmity, war with God. The human heart is at war with God. Desolation, right? We want to do our own thing. We want to rebel. We want to be our own king. What is Antichrist? Everyone says the Antichrist, and it's referred to different ways. What does that mean? This is all leaning into this mindset. Antichrist means that. Antichrist, opposite Christ, against Christ. Listen to what 1 John 4, 1, 3 says. Beloved, do not believe every spirit. And this is very synonymous. Again, this is John writing to the churches and encouraging and and. Reminding believers, this is parallel to what Jesus is saying here. Listen, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you will know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This spirit is of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now in the world already. So some of us have heard the Antichrist. We think of it as a person. But John is saying here, they talk about that. Again, this goes into whether figure or literally one person, but that the spirit is here. And in fact, the spirit is among us. And anything that is Antichrist is Antichrist. So when we are not following God, we are Antichrist. When other religions, religions are fooling people or, or leading people down paths of, 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 of apart from God is antichrist. Uh, and, of course, war, antichrist. The spirit is among us. And it goes on to say in Mark, let's, let's read this next section. 
Let the reader understand, then those in Judea must flee to the mountains. A man on the housetop must not go down and go to get anything out of the house. And a man in the field must not go to get back his coat. Woe to the pregnant women and nursing mothers in those days. So again, this sounds a lot different from if we read, you know, John chapter 3 or something like that. A different type of writing. But he is saying, be prepared and heed my wisdom. Listen to God. Now, some scholars believe that this section that Jesus is talking about was referencing in 67 AD. This happened, okay? Uh, that that uh, there was a, a Jewish revolt and Christians ran to the hills. They ran to the mountains, heeding God's word. And that's recorded in Jewish history. And some believe other things about this passage. But regardless, listen what it says here in verse 18. Pray it won't happen in winter, for those days, for those will be the days of tribulation, the kind ha- hasn't been from the beginning of creation, until now, and never will be again. If the Lord had not cut those days short, no one would be saved. But he cut those days short for the sake of the elect whom he chose. What is he saying to his church? So this isn't just for them. Now, remember, all through the Scripture, this is part of knowing and growing in the Scripture. When we come to God and we come to Christ and we're following Christ, we read the Scripture for the first time, we grow as we read it. We learn to read it. Our our eyes, our, our heart, the Holy Spirit works to help us understand. And much of what is written in the Scripture, then, as we read, it, it we don't change. Men have always been sinners. When I say men, I'm using that broadly. Men and women, humans. The church has always had their challenges because we're battling sin and walking with Jesus. We have this struggle. So what the writers of the scripture are writing to the churches then applies to us now because we're still human beings and we still wrestle with sin. So everything, we don't say, oh, that was for then, this is for now. It's all for now. It's, it's to us as humans. He made us. He knows what we need. And so, and when he's writing this, it's for then, it's for now. It doesn't change. And as, even as we look at prophecy, <laughs> there's always a, a beast. There's always a dragon to slay in our lives, in our world. There's always war. And what I'm trying to get to you here is you can grab it. You, you, it's applicable. It's not just for far away. The churches and the problems in the churches that are described in, in Revelation, the seven churches, those churches are still here. They were then, they were real churches then. They haven't changed. There's still corruption. There's still sin eating up the churches. And, and I don't know if you're aware or not, but if you've doused into the, this a bit, in the lukewarm nature of the church of Laodicea, that's us. That's America. That's the American church. I mean, these things are, there's always a, uh, an antichrist. These things have been since it's been penned and it's here. And right here in Mark, he's saying, pray it won't happen in winter. And, and what he's saying is be prepared. And But he's saying God is with us. Remain faithful among and amidst tribulation. Trusting God. In his ultimate victory. Listen, whether you ever feel like you're in great tribulation or tribulation, however, if you want to make it big, bold print or small, listen, when you're walking through death of a loved one, try to tell someone who's lost someone that doesn't feel like tribulation to them. It, it, it feels like tribulation, it feels like hurt, it feels unnatural. Every funeral I stand at, I I can't help but say it, that when we're at a funeral, it doesn't feel natural. You'd think it would, right? After all the years that, that, that we've been alive and on earth and we know when we're born, we will eventually die. It's not natural. Why? Because God did not make us for death. It isn't natural. Natural is that we live forever. But sin broke that. 
So we are in tribulation in facing sin. We are in, as Christians, tribulation facing a world of sin when we're following Jesus with the hearts of humans being at enmity with God and we need now being at peace with God because of Jesus. Verse 20, listen, here's some more tension for you. Hang on to this. But he cut those days short for the sake of of the elect whom he chose. Why is this here? And I know some of our uh, folks here have been wrestling with some of these subjects right lately and what that means. But that word elect should stir you a bit when you read that. It should humble you. And you can't fully understand what he means by that. Because you're going, I don't deserve that. Exactly. You feel it. You don't play a part in your walk with Jesus. It's all him. At the same time, there's nothing good in you that made you follow and choose God. You're not better than anybody else. We're all sinners dead in our trespasses. God calls us elect, and this kind of stirs us up. Going like, it's not fair. What's not fair is that we all deserve death. We all deserve hell. We all deserve to be separated from God. What's not fair is that Jesus stepped out to come rescue us. And the fact that you feel like you don't deserve that, that's the point. Exactly. Listen, you're not supposed to understand grace. You can understand grace fully. Why? It's an attribute of God, not you. It's a gift to you. Lest any man should boast. If there was something in you that recognized, yeah, I'm one up on that guy because I follow Jesus. What is that? That's pride. That's me earning my salvation. So maybe you feel stirred up about that right now and go, that just seems exactly, you should. He's much bigger. His ways are not our ways. We don't get it. We follow, we're responsible. But he is in full charge down to to the molecule. There is no rogue molecule. It's above your pay grade. You're not going to get your mind around it. Grace is foreign to us. It's an attribute of God. So what he's saying is, look, you're walking with me, church. I will preserve you. I will keep you. You're mine. That is good news. It's not on you. You didn't earn it. You can't lose it. This relationship and love you have with the Father. Now listen. Now I don't want to dig into election too much today. If you shake your fist at God and uh, choose not to follow Him, it's on you. If someone lives their life separate from God and ends up separated from God in hell, it's their fault. If you end up in heaven, eternity with God, knowing him, loving him, that promise, it's his fault. You get that? And you, go, you go home, you're all dismissed, right? Yeah, that's a tension. You can't get your head around it. But he's good, and we rest in that. Uh, we live, we're responsible, yet he is all sovereign. And it shouldn't be Totally understood. I don't deserve it. I don't deserve his love. And secondly, it says false messiahs and deceptions in 13, 21 through 23. Listen to what it says here. If anyone tells you, we see this all the time. I mean, I know as we're reading this, we're going, man, this is, this is real. See, here's the messiah. See there. Do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray. If possible, there it is again, the elect. And you must watch. I have told you everything in advance. You know why I think that word is there? It stands out in this passage, kind of odd. He's reminding us that you are mine. He's reminding his disciples that you are mine. Because you're going to lose hope. You're going to be in fear. You're going to be trembling. He's reminding them. He's reminding us. It's not on you. You're mine. Like calling us his kids. I am preserving you. That's, that, 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 that word should bring hope to us because in the mid of, middle of the tribulation these guys are about to face in, in, in 70 AD what happened with, with Nero burning 
Christians to light his garden parties, that kind of tribulation, if it was on us, I'm out, right? I can't do this. But he's reminding, I will be with you in the fire. I will walk through you. You're mine. False messiahs. There have been, there will be, under the banner of the Christian church even. even. Prosperity gospel preachers are, are preaching heresy. Uh, and I'm not going to name names today, but there's a lot of them filling up churches, saying things even insulting the divinity of Jesus, saying he was born a man and became God, and things like that. It's in the pulpits, major pulpits today. False messiahs. False messiahs of nature worship. Not just in the Christian church. I use that term Christian loosely. Humanitarian messiahs. Right? What's our religion of the day? Political messiahs. Medical science. That's a messiah. If we can just preserve this, extend life. I mean, we're talking about implanting chips in our brains that we can live forever. No thank you. All right? <laughs> I want to go to heaven. Don't want a neuron uh, chip planted in my brain uh, to try to stay and cling to this life longer. Savior's idols. Watch out for the de deception, church. It's everywhere. So how do you filter it? How do you dodge the falsehood? How do you dodge those, those false messiahs? How, what, is, what is your standard? What's your safeguard? What, what keeps you in Christ? Wisdom. Wisdom. Not your own wisdom. The Bible. The Bible is our safeguard. The Bible is our standard. Use scriptural eyes to fend off and reflect falsehoods, untruths. You hear me? Look at this culture. It's amazing how I see the culture seeping into the church. Some people will say they're a Christian, but then they don't think Christian in certain areas. They think culturally. They think popular. And this is in all areas of life. It's amazing. I've been so shocked sometimes by people I love dear to me that will say something and go, where are you getting your truth from? With your morals, with your application of your life, and just living your life, walking this out? Where are you drawing your truth from? Like You, just, you, you walk with Jesus and you're going to say that. Like that is not scriptural. It's in, the, it's in the Bible. God speaks to this. Find it. Know it. Eat it. Make, make it a part of you. Look, look the Bible should, should ingrain us, should transform our minds where we think Jesus. We think God's way, not ours. Transforms us. And that is our preservation, church. Things are going to continue to get blurred. You're, you're saying it right now. We don't know what we can believe. We don't know who we can trust. Trust God's word. Filter everything that comes across social media, in books, through the lens of Scripture. That's the standard. And you'll be able to take thoughts captive, like the Scripture says, and go, that's junk, that's hogwash, to quote a scholar Don Yates, <laughs> or this is truth. Right? <laughs> Lastly, church, endure. So li listen, if you're walking with Jesus right now, this, this stirring you feel, the tension you feel, and Jesus is talking about, look, these days are coming, and they're here, right? The, the madness in our world is here. If you're not reading the Scripture and it's becoming a part of you, transforming you, if you're not in it, you will get sucked in. Your, only, your sword is God's Word. Your offense and defense is God's Word. It, it's got to transform your thinking, and, and you know what happens when it does? and you know God's word, and it's planted in you, you're, you're who God created you to be, and it, it's just like a shield. The, the, the junk just bounces off. Like, that's just baloney. It's there. You're not going to get sucked in. You're not going to get persuaded uh, to falsehoods and mirages and half-truths. You know how to think. Endure, church. God preserves. I'm going to wrap this up. Endure and remain steadfast in this spiritual warfare that you're in against sin, against deception. Listen, John 10, 28. Listen to what Jesus said here, praying for us. 
I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Do you hear that? You're his. Some of you might get fearful in your faith. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Know that he has you. Know that he loves you on your worst day as much as your best day. And that will drive you to want to be better. Not in that moral sense of of just aiming to behave, but wanting to love him more. And loving him more, you obey him more and please him more. And do what he wants you to do. And hate that sin that you so despise. It would drive you to pursue truth, to truth, to, to, to pursue beauty, to pursue him. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. And I and the Father are one. You see what it's saying about his church? This idea of your mind, the elect he's refer, uh, referring to here. He said, no matter what comes that this is the perseverance of the saints. This is, this is what Baptists would say is eternal security when we're in him. Not when we've checked the card, not when we've just said, yeah, I go to church. I'm saying when you know Jesus, the scripture says you are a gift from the Father to, God, to, to, to Jesus, a gift. Who's going to take that away? Is God going to remove his gift to his son? You're his. You can get through, as these, these disciples here are looking at horrible tribulation that's coming. I mean, these guys lost their life for the faith. And he's saying, you're mine. I will be with you in the fire. You will get through it. And this is not it. Even the things that scare us the most, death, I'm there. It's not death for the saint. Church, we don't taste it. It's resurrection. Lastly, This is a great quote I just saw recently. John Piper said about disappointment in life. And the question was, in pertaining to friends and hurting you and the people you love most sometimes, uh, just heartbreak, backstabbing. And they were asking pastors uh, in a pastor's forum, uh, they asked, how, how do you deal with these disappointments when, when a family member you know, just goes astray or... Whatever. And listen to this quote. I love this by John Piper. Listen to what he said. He answered them by saying, love the second coming. Love the second coming. Love the return of Jesus. And this, this was the line that grabbed me. John Piper said this. This world is one conveyor belt of disappointment. <laughs> Every day, right? Some of them, I was talking to Hank. and he, Hank was angry that he got sick. It's like you got too much to do, right? You feel that way too, you get a cold, you're like, ah, oh, another disappointment. Your family disappoints you. You disappoint yourself oftentimes, right? Friends, the ones we love the most, we often treat the worst. Rebel children that maybe go and you don't see them come back. I know as John Piper was saying this, he's got a son that's blatantly, arrogantly, atheistic, and pokes fun at Christianity and his father. The world is one conveyor belt of disappointment. Physical disappointments, suffering disappointments, right? Friendship disappointments. And you know what? The second coming reminds us, church, this is what Jesus is saying to them. You're going to face incredible disappointments. It's going to be okay. It's like your parents, when you're scared as a kid, saying, it's going to be okay. That's what the second coming is, church. We don't live this, in this la-la land, this, this, this mystical vision that's coming, and this world doesn't matter. And, and, and no, no, Jesus is saying, this is real, but that is even more real, and that should make this count even more, because it's going to be okay. All these things we love here, going to be better. All these things that are broken here will, will, will dissipate. We'll be gone. Remember, remember the beautiful verse in Revelation? No more tears. No more sadness. No more fear. No more heartache. 
but it will be made right. And that should free us to live this better, to live it hopeful, to, to enjoy and know that the other stuff that disappoints us, it'll be gone. We keep our eyes on him. The heavenly mindset, church, that's what we live with. This is the point of this. Keep a heavenly mindset. This all leads to his return, where every disappointment will be made right. Revelation shows us a picture of a lamb. Seems odd because it's about judgment, it's about kingship, it's about his power. And on the throne where the judge sits with all power, God doesn't need us. He could crush us. But on the throne is a lamb where the judge sits. It's the lamb. The lamb that was slain. You know what that means for us, church? That we don't sit in his judgment. That he offers himself as a sacrifice for the things we deserve. The lamb that was slain. So we can look to him and know that it's going to be Okay, he's taking, he's taken our enmity and turned it to light, and turned it to life. He took our place. He took that punishment we deserve. Because of that, it's going to be okay. So despise those disappointments in life. They're the result of sin. We feel it. Some of us are feeling that in this time change this morning. The sin, we're, we don't even know how it affects us physically. It's going to be okay. He is making, I love the verse, he's making all things new. May that drive you, may that lead you, church. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that um, we have a hope to look to. And to put this in our simple terms, like the loving parent leading a child through tough times, through disappointment, through hurt, to scrape knees, saying it's going to be okay. Lord, help us to remember that, to live that, to feel that in our soul through the power of your Spirit as we walk out into madness. And our madness here in America just seems surface sometimes compared to, I think, of our persecuted brothers and sisters across the world being martyred uh, for even speaking your name. Literally losing uh, their head uh, for not following a false god and following you, Jesus. Lord, uh, thank you for giving us an olive branch, a, a bridge for our hearts that are war-torn with you and for making our hearts new. If there's anyone here that doesn't know you, Lord, I pray they'd take that step to you and know that you are that bridge. And all they have to do is look to you and say, I want to know you. And I'm reminding of, reminded of your word, John 17, 3 says, this is eternal life, that they know you, Jesus Christ, the one you have sent. Lord, may we know you. May we trust you. May we walk with you. May we look to that day when all things are made new. And this will seem like a past glimpse, a past distant memory, compared to the beauty that we live in, in the new heavens and the new earth. Lord, we thank you so much. Come, Lord. Come quickly. In your name. Amen. May you